Hello there. My name is Scott Silberman, and uh, today I'm doing a presentation on what is Subsequent Injury Benefit Trust Fund. Uh, and I'm recording this in uh, July of 2020. Uh, so if you're watching this a lot later, there may have been things that have changed, maybe majorly, maybe slightly, as the law is always changing. Uh, I'd also note that this uh, presentation was first given in May uh, of this year, and it's being recorded just because of some technical difficulties we had with the recording at that time. So uh, first of all, the topic today is what is subsequent uh, injury benefit um, trust fund? And I'm going to have slides here, as you can hopefully see on your screen, that will go along with what I'm talking about. Okay, so what is Subsequent Injury Benefit Trust Fund? It is a fund run by the state of California for people who have suffered a work-related injury and already had a pre-existing disability injury prior to the work-related injury. So this is very key. It does not apply to every case, uh, every workers' compensation case. It, you, know, you must have had a injury or disability prior to your workers' compensation claim. Now, this is a claim that is separate than your workers' compensation claim. It is not against your employer or your workers' compensation insurance carrier, but it does attach to that claim. Uh, it's given uh, the same case number with the Workers' Compensation Appeals Board and will be kept in the same files as your workers' compensation case. In most cases, this is handled after your workers' compensation claim has concluded. Uh, in fact, there's many defense attorneys who will admittedly know little or nothing about subsequent injuries fund because this case starts when their case stops or ends, the case for your employer or the insurance company. There are a few instances, however, where we do, for strategic reasons, handle the cases at the same time. It is rare, however. Now, I'm often asked this question. Does everyone qualify for subsequent injury benefit trust fund benefits? And the answer uh, is no. In fact, there's strict requirements to qualify for the benefits. And these include, first, you must have an underlying industrial injury. And that injury must either result in 35% disability before age and occupation adjustments, or at least 5% disability before age and occupation, and you have prior disability to a corresponding opposite extremity. So if you're an attorney watching this, this may make a lot of sense. And if you're not an attorney, it probably doesn't make much sense at all. But basically, we have to have an industrial injury with pretty substantial disability before this possibility is even triggered. The only exception uh, for having 35% uh, disability, which is relatively substantial in most workers' compensation cases, is when we're involving a corresponding opposite extremity. For example, if you have a, a work injury to your right arm and you have a prior injury to your left arm uh, that's somewhat disabling, then our requirement for the work-related injury is 5%. Um, now, once we get past that prong, you still have to have pre-existing disability. And when we combine the pre-existing disability with your work-related injury, it has to result in at least 70% disability overall for you to qualify for any benefits at all from the subsequent injury benefit trust fund. So in sum, in order to qualify, you must have an industrial injury. That industrial injury must rate to 35% disability before what we call adjustments for age and occupation, or 5% and involve a corresponding opposite body part. And then when we combine your, and you have to have pre-existing disability, and that pre-existing disability when combined with your industrial disability 
has to uh, equal at least 70 in total. All right, so another thing I'm often asked is, when would I know if I qualify for these benefits? Well, in most cases, we're evaluating these claims at the time a workers' compensation claim is settling or when it's being prepared for settlement. Now, there's some cases where we have to evaluate the liability earlier. And when is that? We'll evaluate it earlier. First, if you have a prior subsequent injuries fund award, then we're going to uh, evaluate for this the day we sign on the claim, the, the day that we meet you, uh, to see if we're going to need to file a second subsequent injuries fund claim for you. Also, if you have a prior workers' compensation award, we also look at these earlier. Um, and in these cases, it's best for us to evaluate and file your claims within five days of the five years of the date of injury because of statute of limitation purposes. Um, what statute of limitations is, is the time limit that you have to file a claim. Now, there's no actual written time limit in the labor code for filing a subsequent injuries fund claim. And in fact, there was a recent in-bank case uh, that came out just a couple weeks ago uh, that specifically addressed this and has ca caused a little bit of confusion, I think, in our industry. However, what is said is that it has to be filed within a reasonable time. And typically, a reasonable time has been held to be either five years of date of injury or a year after the finding of permanent uh, disability uh, or an award or settlement by the Workers' Compensation Appeals Board, whichever is later. Um, however, there have been some cases to find that, uh, especially with these exceptions I talked about, that it may be within the five years of date of injury because you already knew or should have known of the subsequent injuries fund claim early on, especially if you had a prior subsequent injuries fund award, which is very rare to have two of those. So what is the process for evaluating these claims here at our office at Silverman and Lamb? So basically there's two types of cases that we see for the subsequent injury benefit trust fund. One is cases that we did handle the industrial injury case, so we know the case very well. And others are where we did not handle the subsequent, the, the industrial injury case. It was handled either by an applicant who did not have an attorney or by another attorney. Uh, and these cases are often referred to our office from other attorneys who don't handle subsequent injury benefit trust fund cases. Now, when we're handling the industrial injury, we're always looking for pre-existing conditions. We will note the file early on, and we may handle the case differently if we see there's a subsequent injury benefit trust fund exposure. Um, as far as handling it differently, uh, it's because we're, we're going to possibly be asking doctors to provide ratings or opinions on pre-existing conditions if we know that's going to be uh, an issue after the workers' compensation claim settles. Um, and if it appears that the case may qualify for subsequent injury benefit trust fund benefits, then we do a subsequent injury be benefit trust fund interview or questionnaire with our clients. And usually this occurs at the time of, of settlement or just after. And these cases in our office are usually evaluated by me for referral to our subsequent injury benefit trust fund uh, department. But there are times when other attorneys in the office will look at the file too. Um, I do handle a lot of the subsequent injury benefit trust fund issues in our office. However, Now, how about cases where the industrial claim or what we call the case in chief was not handled by Silverman and Lamb, handled by another firm? Now, as I said, we often do get cases referred by other attorneys 
who do not handle the subsequent injuries fund cases, or clients often find us on the internet or through talking uh, with other injured workers to find our office for their subsequent injury benefit trust fund issues. Now for these cases, we review the settlement documents. We review any maximum medical improvement reports and ratings or decisions from the Workers' Compensation Appeals Board in regards to these cases, as well as the questionnaire from our clients in regards to the subsequent injury benefit trust fund. So if you are planning to come to our office for an initial uh, interview and your case was handled by somebody else for the regular case and you'd like to see us for the subsequent injuries benefit trust fund, it really speeds up the process if you do have access to the reports for the final reports from both your treating doctors as well as any qualified medical examiners or agreed medical examiners. If you don't have access to them, that's fine. We can try to get those from your attorney uh, or from the uh, insurance company in the case that you represented yourself. Now, it is very important that we see potential clients either within five years of the date of injury or one year from the settlement or award because there'll be a good chance that any claim may be barred if it's not filed within that time. Uh, if there is uh, an uh, extenuating circumstance, uh, we're happy to look at other cases as well. Uh, but, it, and, but this is in general um, what our uh, guidelines will be in signing on a case. Now, you're asking, well, okay, so maybe I have a subsequent injury benefit trust fund case. Well, how long is it going to take for me to get this resolved? And the answer is the time frame in the subsequent injuries fund case is similar to a workers' compensation case when we say it depends. And I'm sure perhaps you have a case that it took years to resolve, and you know someone else has a case that resolved within a year. Um, subsequent injuries fund case uh, definitely depends. Uh, the process in our office is as follows. The first thing we do is we're going to meet with you, evaluate and decide if we want to pursue the case. This process will involve an interview with an attorney, a review of the medical and the legal file, and it can take anywhere from that initial interview to a couple days from when we get all the documents. So if you come in with all the documents, there's a good chance if I meet with you, I can make a decision right then. If not, it will just take a day or two. This is a very short process. It's the signing up process. Now the next step in the process is ordering records. And this can be in many cases, the longest part of the process. We start with a list of all the doctors prior to your injury that you remember. When I say all the doctors, I'm talking about the doctors you've seen that you recall from the time of birth up until now. And we know for most people, we're not gonna be getting records from the time of, of birth, especially you know, as far as pre-existing conditions and so forth. But in, we go back as far as we can to make sure everything's well documented. We then order other records that we discover. For example, you may re remember that you've gone to Kaiser for the last 10 years and you don't remember who you went to before Kaiser. So we'll order your Kaiser records. And then from the Kaiser records, we may get your initial intake sheet you had with Kaiser, which said you were with uh, an HMO with Blue Cross or Blue Shield, perhaps it was Monarch, Edinger Medical Group, one of the many HMOs out there, and we will attempt to order their records. And we'll continue to do that, get as many records as we can, because this is very important for subsequent injuries fund. In fact, in most cases, they're not even going to make us an offer of, we can't come up with at least 200 pages of records that predate your industrial injury. So this can be a, the most time consuming uh, process. And as far as this time frame, I can tell you it can be anywhere from three months to over a year for us to track down uh, these records. Now next, once we've determined that we have all the records we can get, or at least all the records that we need, uh, we're going to send uh, you out to what's called a QME or a qualified medical examiner. Um, this is similar to the uh, process that you probably went through in your workers' comp case, but in this case, we will get to select the qualified medical examiners. In some case, if we have a good AME on the case or a good QME, 
from your industrial case, we may send you back to that same doctor, but usually it'll be somebody familiar with subsequent injury benefit trust fund case. Now, what's the role of a QME doctor in a subsequent injury benefit trust fund the case? So the QME's role is to address the pre-existing injuries and disability. Now, in general, uh, apportionment is not an issue. Uh, and again, this is geared more towards the doctors to tell them this, because I know we've had a, a number of doctors attend our webinars. And so this uh, is not just geared towards injured workers, but also both doctors and defense attorneys have been watching this as well. Um, so apportionment is what's related to the work-related injury and what's not related to the work-related injury. Now, the reason why we say in general apportionment is not related is because we're looking to your disability as a whole prior to your industrial injury. We don't care if it was partially caused by your genes or you were you know, born with predisposition and also possibly caused to environmental exposure. Um, it doesn't matter what's the cause of it as long as it's pre-existing. Uh, so the only time apportionment would really be an issue is if it overlapped with our current industrial injury meaning that perhaps 30% of the disability was apportioned to your current industrial claim and the balance is pre-existing. Then we do need apportionment addressed and that the prior amount was pre-existing and labor disabling and that laid out by the doctor. Now, if, there, um, if it is overlapping disability and needs to be pointed by the doctor, whether the pre-existing portion was present in what we call labor disabling prior to the industrial injuries. Now, QMEs should point out work restrictions that predated the industrial injuries. And I have had um, doctors tell me, well, how do I know what the pre-existing you know, restrictions would have been? And part of that needs to be part of the interview, the QME interview that's done with the injured workers. For example, if the applicant had pre-existing asthma, then likely the applicant was avoiding dust, gas, or fumes. Also, the applicant likely carried an inhaler with them. Whether they were you know, able to, to work as a construction worker or in the sports industry, perhaps they were an athlete, but likely if you have asthma, you're gonna have an inhaler with you in your sports bag, in your back pocket if you're a construction worker. And in the off event that you have an uh, attack, then you would use this. And you may also take, um, so you may have restrictions of both carrying an inhaler and um, exposure to dust, gas, or fumes, but it's important for the QMEs to talk to the injured workers and find out what restrictions they were actually following in their life prior to the industrial injury. All right, so now we've secured the records. We've sent out uh, the injured worker out to the QME exams. Now what happens next? So every case is different. In some cases, we may need a vocational expert. A vocational expert is somebody who may say, that the person is to evaluate whether the person is or is not able to compete in the labor market. Um, this is often used in a case where we feel that the injured worker is 100% disabled when we combine both the pre-existing and the industrial um, injuries or disability. We then usually send a demand to the subsequent injury benefit trust fund. Our demand will include a detailed letter outlining what we feel the total disability is for the, the applicant. It will include um, any ratings that we are proposing as far as the uh, rating for the applicant. Uh, it'll outline the pre-existing uh, disability and um, uh, have a pretty detailed letter. Also attached to that is gonna be any documents that we feel are needed by the subsequent injury benefit trust fund adjuster and attorney. This will include all prior awards, all prior settlement documents, our QME exams from the SIBTF claim, as well as any 
uh, final reports from primary treating doctors, QMEs or AMEs that were relied on in the underlying case. Now, once that's sent out, we're gonna file for what's called a status conference. So the status conference is usually the first time we really get to talk to the subsequent injury benefit trust fund. At this time, they are a little overwhelmed uh, with claims. And so in most cases, resolution isn't really discussed until we actually have a conference and it's reviewed by an attorney for the, um, for the upcoming status conference. Now the status conference, we'll get to hear subsequent injuries fund arguments. In some cases, they say they find fault in our QME reports. Things are lacking. Uh, they may say that we're claiming injuries that didn't predate the industrial injury, or it's not well documented. They may ask for more records, that they're missing records from somewhere. So we use this to find out what else is needed by the subsequent injury benefit trust fund. And we'll go out then and, and try to get what's needed. Now, sometimes at a status conference, it'll get, we've decided that we have everything we need, but we cannot resolve the case. So we'll continue it to a mandatory settlement conference. Um, or we can file for a mandatory settlement conference if we have determined we feel that we have everything that we need. So prior to the terminology, it is not mandatory we settle at this type of conference. And you've hopefully learned this through your workers' compensation claim. What it means is if we don't settle at this settlement conference, it allows us to set it for trial. It's mandatory that we have this conference before a case gets set for trial, uh, which is how I believe the name was derived. Then after an MSC, if we're still not able to resolve the case, uh, then we can uh, go to trial uh, or at any time during this entire process, we can discuss settlement with the uh, subsequent injury benefit trust fund. Now let's say we do go to trial or we do settle the case. Of course, a question for any injured worker is, well, what benefits can I receive from the subsequent uh, injury benefit trust fund? So the subsequent injury benefit trust fund will pay you the difference between your total overall rating, including the industrial and the, the, the prior uh, disability, subject to some credits and offsets. What are credits and offsets? Well, first of all, uh, the offset is going to be the industrial injury. So that's where the difference is. Um, so your current workers' compensation award is something that's always going to be uh, deducted. Um, and I'll show you a little bit later how this, how this works. Any prior workers' compensation awards will apply as a credit. So that's a dollar for dollar credit. So if you have a prior award from 15 years ago where you uh, recovered 15,000, um, you know, maybe on, a, uh, on a, an permanent disability, then that would be credited against this award. A social security disability insurance award is partially offset uh, by some formulas that's a little bit more involved than what I'm going to go through uh, today. But um, in brief, as an example, if you have a 70% industrial injury from a workers' compensation uh, award, then 30% of the um, Social Security disability amounts that you get will be credited against your award. Um, it's basically 100 minus your current industrial injury. Disability pensions are also subject to, a, to an offset. Now, let's say we went to trial. We got a 100% award from a judge, but I have all these credits and offsets. So how does that work? Well, what's going to happen is you're going to get an award, in some cases a settlement, in some cases after trial. And then we're going to get an award letter from the subsequent injuries fund. So here's an example of what an award letter looks like with some credits for a subsequent injuries benefit fund case, which we were able to get an award for 100% uh, disability. All right, so from this award, 
you'll see here that, uh, and this was just a recent award from a few months ago. The, uh, the first line uh, is saying what the current yearly uh, weekly rate will be. And this has already been factored in uh, as far as credits and offsets already. So this is just telling you that in this particular case, based on the injured workers wages, is entitled to uh, $755.10 and, and, uh, a week. And of that, $1,283.67 is paid to um, the uh, uh, injured worker every two weeks. And 15% or $226.53 is paid to the uh, attorney. And uh, uh, currently, uh, it's usually, well, current cases is 18% um, is what our office is uh, requesting uh, for um, attorney fees. Um, in 2021, this is actually showing you how the amount is calculated. So starting in 2021, there's a weekly rate of $1,256.37 plus a COLA, cost of living increase. That's the total amount of the award. Now what's gonna be subtracted from this is $270 per week. And that's $270 per week that the applicant should be uh, um, entitled to from the industrial injury case for that award. Also, social security disability is another offset of $231.89 per week. So you'll see 11-18-2021 uh, is gonna be the, they're gonna stop subtracting the indemnity. That's the $270. And that is because that is when the applicant's award is scheduled to end. I don't remember the exact percent. It was probably 65, 66%, but that scheduled end date is uh, 2021. Uh, I'm sorry, 11, 17, 2021. Then starting next year, the only thing that'll be offset is social security disability. And starting in 2022, then we're no longer subtracting social security disability. And that's because if you are on Social Security retirement, there is no deduction. However, if you are on Social Security disability, uh, there is. All right, so often when I get calls, when the cases have been referred by another uh, attorney or attorney's office, um, or they just called me because their attorney told them to try to find another attorney to subsequent injuries fund cases, people ask me, well, why doesn't my attorney handle this kind of case? Well, there's many reasons. Uh, and, uh, you know, many of us, we find something that we learn well, for me as workers' comp, but including subsequent injury benefit trust fund. And we want to narrow in on that type of case. For some people, they're police officer and firefighter, and they're very, uh, have a very limited practice, and that's what they handle. For other people, they handle the sports cases, and they limit their practice to those type of cases. So everyone, uh, you know, many people do limit uh, what they do. One of the reasons why attorneys also don't like it is attorney fees are paid out on a bi-weekly and many firms are not set up uh, for that type of recovery. Also, in some cases with the offsets and credits, payments some in occasion don't start until years after the settlement. So, for that reason, it's something that not all attorney firms are set up to wait if payments in your case may not start for three or four years after the settlement. Um, also, the process of obtaining records and finding CUMEs familiar with SIBTF can be a long and involved process. Uh, we've had to meet and, and train many doctors on how to do this. Uh, and for that reason, um, not all attorneys uh, are um, handling subsequent injury benefit trust funds. All right, so another call that I get sometimes is, well, what if I've already settled my workers' compensation uh, case? Now, if it's still within five years of your date of injury or one year from the date that you settled your case, you can still file the SIBTF claim uh, if you meet the underlying conditions that we talked about before. 
Uh, there may be some issues where you can file uh, later, it would still be reasonable. And um, if you have, you know, uh, some type of exception like that, you want to talk about, please uh, feel free to contact me. Um, and you can use a different attorney to file your SIBTF case uh, if you if you wish. Um, you people do ask me if they can file this case by themselves, and of course you can represent yourself on on anything. However, well, um, it's quite complex as far as the uh, the rules, uh, gathering the the records, getting to the QMEs uh, that you can. Um, get to the do uh, SIBTF. So this is a case where I would highly recommend that you find a workers' compensation uh, attorney to handle your case. All right, so uh, now I have a lot of time for questions and I do have some questions uh, that were um, asked when I did this live a couple months ago. So I'll go ahead and go through those questions again. Um, First question I had was, do people only qualify for subsequent injury benefit trust fund if they had an industrial or work injury? And the answer is yes. You first have to have a California workers' compensation claim uh, that, as we said, resulted in either 35% or 5% disability before we can start the subsequent injury benefit trust fund process. Uh, next question was, what happens if I don't remember who I saw 20 plus years ago for medical treatment regarding pre-existing conditions. Well, that's one reason why you're hiring us is to, or another workers' compensation attorney is to help to track down those records or at least as much records as we need to um, prove that you had a labor disabling uh, disability prior to your industrial injury. Uh, I was asked if depression is a disability, and yes, it is, especially if you're actively ongoing treatment or had treatment prior to your industrial injury, then we can, uh, depression, anxiety, any psychological or psychiatric injury can be a pre-existing condition. Okay, so uh, someone had asked, they didn't understand in the example, uh, the slide that we have, which I'll go back to you, is why $270 per week was being deducted uh, in this case. And that was the, the person's permanent disability rate under their industrial claim was 270 per week. So that is why that was being deducted. Someone also asked if their industrial case is settled by compromise and release, a lump sum settlement, then how do we determine the percentage of offset uh, if it wasn't found by a judge. And we do that based on the prior reports. We'll give our ratings. In many cases, the ratings may be in a compromise and release agreement, which helps us. Uh, uh, but if not, we can rate the reports uh, and decide on the amount with subsequent injuries fund. That's something that can be negotiated or tried um, by a judge. Okay, now this was actually a very good and timely question, even more timely now than it was in May. And are the pre-existing and an industrial permanent disability numbers combined with the combined values chart or are they added together? Uh, so this again is a bit technical for most injured workers, but uh, there was a, an in-bank decision that came out that said that in most cases they are gonna be added together except when there's overlap. And of course, subsequent injuries fund is gonna be over, arguing overlap all the time. Uh, I think that's gonna be a new buzzword we're gonna hear from the subsequent injuries benefit trust fund attorneys. Uh, but um, our goal is to try to add them uh, in uh, most cases. Okay, so somebody asked if we can confuse, they were confused on what percentage of disability is needed for subsequent injuries fund. They heard me mention three numbers, 5%, 35%, and 70%. So the 5% or 35% is what would be needed on your industrial injury case, and that's before adjustments for age and occupation. 
and 70% is what we need overall, including the disability prior to your industrial injury. Okay, do we always settle via stipulation or do we settle via compromise and release as well? Most cases are gonna settle via stipulation, that's with the payments. It's, it's rare that subsequent injuries fund will settle with a compromise and release that's an acceptable value to the injured woman. Okay, and here's one that was working is, is that the, the case settled by stipulations and I return to work. I'm still working my full duties, which is a sedentary job, which means they're sitting in the desk. Um, it, however, I did have a prior injury and pre-existing conditions. Can I file for subsequent injuries fund even though I'm still working? And the answer is yes. Your current work status does not affect your ability to file for a subsequent injury benefit trust fund case. All right, so that was my uh, presentation here on um, the uh, Subsequent Injury Benefit Trust Fund. Uh, I want to thank you all for um, uh, watching. And uh, if you have any questions, um, well, it's not on here. I should have put it on here. My uh, email address, the best email address to get from me is going to be questions, just like it shows on your screen there. But then it's going to be at silbermanlam.com. It's, it's questions at S-I-L-B-E-R-M-A-N-L-A-M dot com. Thank you again, and uh, feel free to contact me with any questions you have.